Hello, beautiful souls. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. My name is Carolyn and this channel is all about true crime, mystery, and anything abnormal. I highly recommend subscribing because this channel is definitely a vibe. And I just want to thank all my returning subscribers. I appreciate you guys so much and thank you so much for joining me again. If this is your first time here, welcome and let's get into today's story. Today's story is about John Goubert, who was the Boy Scout who became a serial killer. He's also sometimes known as the Nebraska Boy Snatcher. John Gobert was born July 2nd, 1963 in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and he was the eldest of two children. His parents, Joseph and Beverly, had a very violent relationship. John witnessed his father attempt to strangle his mother before his mother and father got divorced when John was six years old. John and his sister lived with their mother, who was extremely domineering, extremely controlling, extremely emotionally abusive, and she refused to allow the children to see their father. And it was something that always bothered John, that he was not allowed to see his father. But his father did attempt to strangle the mother, so I don't know exactly the situation. Was he not allowed to see his father to protect him or was the mother being spiteful? I don't know. But the father obviously had a lot of issues, but the mother, she definitely had a lot of issues as well. John's mother had an extremely bad temper and she would lash out at both children over the smallest thing. And she, there was a lot talked about that she really humiliated John and would go out of her way to humiliate John. And for this to be happening in childhood is never a good sign. John's mother would not allow John to make friends and he was definitely an outcast at school. John was bullied a lot at school because he was the smallest kid in his class. And I mean, kids are so cruel. Like he was literally bullied because he was small. It's just, kids. it's amazing how cruel kids can be. But John was bullied all through school. When it came to academics, John did very well at school. He was very intelligent and he always got good grades. The family moved to Portland, Maine when John was 11 years old. To earn money, John got a paper route and he would also take on several jobs in the summer to earn his own money. John joined the Boy Scouts sort of in an attempt. He felt so isolated and so lonely. So he joined the Boy Scouts almost in a way to break up that type of isolation that he was feeling. And he was very successful in the Boy Scouts. He rose to the highest rank of Eagle Scout. But on the inside, John was having very dark, sadistic urges. And they were getting harder and harder for him to control. John would get sexually aroused at the idea of killing and the idea of tying up and gagging people. And all of this had happened before John had even turned 13. So his dark sadistic ways started out very, very young. When he was 13, he stabbed a girl with a pencil. And when he did it, the little girl cried in pain. And John would later say how he became very sexually aroused at the girl crying in pain. So inflicting pain was something that was very arousing to him. And it just gets worse and worse. He was so aroused when he had stabbed the girl with the pencil. The next day he decided to escalate it. This time he took a razor blade and he slashed a girl as he was driving by on his bicycle. In another incident, he beat a young boy and attempted to strangle him. And all of this happened before he had even graduated high school. John graduated high school in 1981. On August 22nd, 1982, 
11-year-old Ricky Stetson decided that he was going to go for a jog. He left home and he was headed to a trail that was 3.5 miles long that he was going to go and jog. When he had not returned by the time it got dark out, his parents contacted the police. The next day, his body was discovered on Interstate 295. The attacker had attempted to undress Ricky. He was stabbed and strangled, and he was also bit. A suspect who was not John was actually held in jail for a year and a half as being the suspect who police believed had killed Ricky. And he wasn't released until a year and a half later when his teeth marks didn't match the bite marks that were on Ricky's body. John had committed his first murder at the age of 19 and he got away with it. On Sunday, September 18th, 1983, Danny Eberly, who was a newspaper delivery boy, headed out to deliver his papers. Later that day, when only three of the 70 newspapers that he was supposed to deliver were delivered, his bike was actually found at the fourth house, which would have been his fourth delivery. His bike was found outside of the house. All of the newspapers that he was supposed to deliver were also found on the ground. It didn't look like there had been any type of struggle, but Danny was missing. Danny's brother, who also delivered papers, told police that he had not seen anything that day, but in the last few days, he had noticed a tanned colored car with a white male driving following him. John would later tell police that he had gone up to Danny and at knife point covered his mouth with his hand and ordered him to get into his car and he took him out to a gravel road. John had made Danny strip down to his underwear. He had also bound his hands and his feet and covered his mouth with surgical tape. John then went on to torture Danny with a knife for an extended period of time before eventually stabbing him nine times, killing him. After a three-day search, Danny's body was found in an area with tall grass near a gravel road, and he was about four miles from where his bike had been discovered. Because it was a kidnapping, the FBI was called in to investigate. The investigators followed several leads, and they ended up arresting one man who, a week after Danny had been killed, this other perpetrator had essayed two young boys. He failed a polygraph, and he had lied about his alibi, but he didn't fit the profile that the FBI had created for this killer. He was eventually released for lack of evidence. Other pedos in the area had been investigated, but the case eventually went cold because they just ran out of leads and they just had no idea who had done this. John had now gotten away with two murders and he had never even been suspected in either of them. On December 2nd, 1983, Christopher Wallen, who was 12 years old, disappeared from Papillion, Nebraska. Christopher had disappeared about three miles from where Danny's body had been found. Witnesses of this crime said that they had seen a very suspicious white man driving a tan car in the area around the time that Christopher went missing. John later told police he had driven up to Christopher flashed his knife at him and ordered Christopher to get in the car. After driving outside of town, John had ordered Christopher to strip down to his underwear, which Christopher did, but when John ordered him to lay down, Christopher refused. After a brief struggle, John had overpowered him and ended up stabbing him to death. John had cut Christopher's neck 
so deeply that he was almost decapitated. Although the crimes were similar, Christopher's was a little bit different because he wasn't bound like the other two. His body was hidden, which the other two boys, there was very little attempt to hide their body, where with Christopher's body, he did make an attempt to hide him. Christopher also had been killed immediately after he had been abducted, which was different than the other two boys. The other two boys seemed to have been tortured for a period of time before their young lives were taken. On January 11th, 1984, a preschool teacher contacted police to tell them about a suspicious man driving in the area. When the driver noticed that the preschool teacher was writing down his license plate, he went up to her, threatened her before fleeing. The car was not tan, but when police traced the license plate, they found out it was a rented car and it had been rented by John. It turned out that John's car was tan and was a Chevrolet sedan, but his car was being repaired on the day that the preschool teacher had seen him driving around. John had joined the military and when his barracks were searched, police found rope consistent with the rope that was used to bind Danny. The FBI found out that the unique rope had been made for the US military and it had been made in South Korea. Under interrogation, John admitted to getting the rope from a scoutmaster in a troop which he was an assistant in. Robert Ressler, the FBI's top profiler, got involved in the case at this point. If you've never heard of him before, he is the person who coined the term serial killer. He also, if you've seen the Netflix series Mindhunter or read the book Mindhunter, the main character in that series and that book are based on Robert. He also worked on a lot of very high profile cases. He worked on the Jeffrey Dahmer case. He worked on Ted Bundy's case. And he also worked on John Wayne Gacy's case, along with a lot more. Robert had the information about the two boys in Nebraska, and he came up with a profile that perfectly matched John. Robert, while presenting the cases of the two boys in Nebraska, a police officer from Portland, Maine, noticed that this was very similar to a case that had taken place in his jurisdiction. At this point, the FBI had connected the two boys in Nebraska who had been killed, but this police officer from Maine noticed that this matched Danny's case very closely. And then when he looked into it, he found out that his the first crime had been committed before John had joined the military. And so that's how the three cases were all kind of put together. And I just want to point out the amazing police work that was done in this case, because so many times in true crime, we're always pointing out the mistakes of the police. And there are a lot of cases where police really, really mess up. If you haven't seen the story that I did about, it's called The Girl in the Bunker. It is like police mistake over and over and over. But I think it's also important to recognize when police do really good work. And this police officer in Maine was able to then group these three killings all together because it always seems in true crime like the police are just messing up all the time. But there is a lot of amazing police officers who do a lot of amazing work and I think in true crime cases we just always get to hear about the cases where not such great police officers do work so I just wanted to point out in this case that the police really did an amazing job um, putting all of this together and solving this case. Bite marks then conclusively confirmed that John was responsible for the killing in Maine as well. The FBI and the police were able to conclude that 
John had joined the military in an attempt to get away from Maine after he had killed Ricky, who was his first victim. Further investigation in Maine found two more crimes because at this point, the police knew about the girl who was stabbed with the pencil and then they had known about Ricky's murder, but they didn't know of any crimes that had been committed in between those two. But in 1980, John had slashed a nine-year-old boy and a female in her 20s. Both of them were cut extremely deeply and they were, they did survive, but they were very lucky to survive because they did sustain very serious injuries. John ended up pleading guilty. He was sentenced to two death sentences in Nebraska and in Maine, there was no death penalty. So he was sentenced to life in prison in Maine. On July 17th, 1996, John was executed in the electric chair in Nebraska. So that is today's story. I hope that you enjoyed it. It's always a little weird saying enjoyed when we're talking about true crime, but you get what I mean, right? Um, so I just want to thank everyone who is watching the videos, liking, commenting. If you'd like to support the channel, I'd love for you to check out another video of mine and I will see you in the next one.